Hey, I think it's muted at the church. Thank you for letting us know about the sound also. So later in our service, we are going to hear a reading from Paul, where Paul writes to a new church, a community that is just getting to know each other, just figuring out how to work together, how to live together, how to collaborate together. Uh, and he uses a really powerful metaphor. He talks about the body. And then he talks about how our groups, our churches, are kind of like a body. But he starts by focusing on the different parts of the human body and the things that those parts do for us. So he sort of starts by saying, well, what would, what would it be to be a body without uh, ears? What do you enjoy about having ears? What would it be to be a body without eyes? What do you enjoy about having eyes? What would it be to be a body without a foot? What do you enjoy about having a foot? We often think about ourselves sort of in the fullness of our bodies, um, but Paul invites us to think specifically about how the parts of the body work together. So I was thinking about this just over the course of the last few days and really letting myself feel so grateful for the things I get to see, for the faces of my children, for clouds in the sky. Yesterday we saw a stunning sunset over the Pacific Ocean, and it just, it was so glorious, and I felt so grateful for the gift of sight. I also have been noticing the gift of sound, sounds of my friends' voices in my ear, sounds of live music, which we didn't get to hear for so long, sounds of songs that I really love. My family is very into Sing 2 and Encanto, which are two animated films right now that have great soundtracks. And I've been just so grateful for that gift. Or the gift of, you know, I like to run and walk. The gift of my legs that kind of move me around the hills and let me get out and see different parts of this area. What a huge gift. So I wonder if you want to take a moment and think about some of the ways in which the different parts of your body help you experience the world more fully. Maybe feeling grateful for the taste of a yummy dinner or a delicious dessert recently, or something beautiful you got to see or hear. So then Paul goes on to say that actually we as a church are like a body. We rely on each other to see more clearly, to hear the sounds of the world and the teachings of our communities more fully. We rely on each other to be effective in the world, to accomplish things that we set out to do and to be the people that God is calling us to be. We need each other the same way I need all the different parts of me to be a whole and healthy and happy person. So I invite you to think about this in the days ahead, the ways in which working together, collaborating gives us different gifts, especially perhaps when it's challenging. I'll commend that to you for the week. Amen. Okay, now it's time for our closing prayer. And I'm sure that most of you know how this goes. First thing we're going to, we're going to be using our hands. This is another part of our body. We're going to be using our hands. So let's wake up our hands. Wake up our hands. Get your fingers moving. Warm everything up. Put your warm hands over your heart. Let's pray. Gracious God, we are so grateful for all of the senses that we have. 
all the ways that we have of experiencing you, all the ways we have of experiencing the glory of your world, the wonderful things that you have put here in the world for us to live with, take care of, and enjoy. Help us to be grateful all the time, most of all, for the ways that we see you in all of these things. That we can know that as we see you, we learn more how to love one another. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'll invite you now to join us in our closing song, Go Now in Peace. Go now in peace. children's service. If you're only able to join us for this part of the morning, we invite you to go in peace, but we hope you'll stay. Our 1015 service of Holy Eucharist will begin soon, and the prelude will start shortly.
Blessed be the one, holy, and living God. Glory to God forever and ever. Together, Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. God be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Give us grace, O Lord, to answer readily the call of our Savior Jesus Christ and proclaim to all people the good news of his salvation. That we and all the whole world may perceive the glory of his marvelous works, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.
They gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine, and send portions of them to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy in the Lord is your strength. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. A reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. Just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. 
For in the one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and those members of the body that we think less honorable we clothe with great honor, and our less respectable members are treated with greater respect. Whereas our more respectable members do not need this, but God has so arranged the body, giving the great honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ and, in, and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret, but strive for the greater gifts. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, 
because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. of our loving, liberating, and life-giving God. Amen. You may be seated. What really does it mean to be a Christian? I wonder how you would respond if someone asked you that. Does it mean belonging to a church? Does it only mean belonging to a church? Do you have to be baptized? Must you have a personal relationship with Jesus? Is it about what you believe, or about what you do, or some combination of the two? With more than 2,000 years to wrestle with this question, we have managed to make our responses both complex and confusing, but perhaps not always compelling. The most orthodox definition of a Christian is simply someone who follows the way of Jesus. While at times there seems to be a lot Jesus forgot to tell us about during his brief ministry on this earth, he did, thankfully, clearly state what he saw as his calling. Today, after teaching and healing across the Galilee to much acclaim, Jesus returns to Nazareth, his hometown, finds his way to the familiar synagogue, and begins to read from the book of the prophet Isaiah, which Luke's gospel quotes verbatim. What is the way of Jesus? It is bringing good news to the poor. It is proclaiming release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. It is letting the oppressed go free, proclaiming the year of the Lord's favor. A reference to the ancient custom of the Jubilee year, prescribed in the book of Leviticus, when all debts were canceled, lands were restored to their original owners, and those who found themselves enslaved were freed. This is not just another parable, some obtuse wisdom saying, a specific guidance for a particular practical problem. This is Jesus telling us what he has been anointed to do with his one wild and precious life, and what we, those of us bold, audacious, and perhaps foolish enough to wish to follow in his footsteps, are also called to do. I was 18 years old the first time someone explained this to me in a way that really clicked. It was my sophomore year of college, and I'd been accepted into a semester-long program offered by Duke Chapel that combined a daily prayer practice, a class on liberation theology and the history of Central America, and a two-week-long trip with Heifer International to a small village in rural Honduras. I hesitate to call this a service trip. 
we all understood that the tens of thousands of dollars it would take for us to travel would really be better spent on all sorts of resources locally that could have had a much broader and more enduring impact than our brief visit ever would. The trip, to the extent that it was necessary, was necessary because of the relationships it enabled and the ways it changed those of us who took part. Over the course of the months before and afterward, we met weekly to read the prophets and pray. We reflected about where the church and the world intersect and what a faithful response to social issues and injustice might be. We learned about the complex history of American imperialism in Central America and our implication in the wars that gripped many of these nations in the 70s and 80s. We immersed ourselves in Latin American liberation theologians who were convicted, as today's gospel asserts, that the primary work of God in the world is in setting the captives free, and that this, therefore, is the core of the mission and ministry of the church, wherever the church may find itself. Seeing this kind of poverty for the first time in my life was transformative. We heard stories from sugarcane farmers who worked for American corporations doing physically excruciating labor and earned less than a dollar a day. We saw how hard the women worked to feed and educate their children with little or no infrastructure or social programs to support them and few opportunities for future generations to look forward to. We also heard the stories of courageous visionaries, people like Archbishop Oscar Romero and the Jesuit priests and nuns who organized poor rural communities throughout Central America, who saw the many forces at work in creating and perpetuating endemic poverty and stood against them as a faithful expression of their desire to follow the way of Jesus. And at every turn, we came back to Jesus' own words. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. We prayed with this text day after day, asking ourselves and each other in Durham and Tegucigalpa alike, who are the poor? in our world, and what would it mean to bring them good news? Not surprisingly, the best answers we discovered didn't come from our own prayer and study, but from the people we met in Honduras. What is good news, we asked, directly and indirectly, while clapping tortillas between our hands and chasing giggling children and sitting around the evening fire together? Good news, they told us would be rest. It would mean work that actually provided for our families. It would mean schools and futures for our children. Good news would mean that fewer babies died and more of us could read and that our lands weren't being poisoned by factories owned by people who live far, far away. Who are the poor, we asked. And surely we can ask the same about our own communities, our own corner of creation. Who are the poor? And what good news are they longing for? Who are the captives in need of release? Are they in jails or detention centers? Are they stuck in abusive marriages or exploitative jobs? Who are the blind? And what would it mean for them to recover their sight? Are they literally those who cannot see? Or those who cannot see clearly our world as it is and as it could be? Are they us? Are they others? Who are the oppressed? And what will it look like for them to go free? What good news is being proclaimed by the liberation movements of our own time? Movements that further the dignity of black lives, civil rights for those who identify as LGBTQ, dignity for immigrants, equity for women? What if we forgave our debtors and our debts were forgiven? What would a world without student loans or credit cards look like, let alone more exploitative and predatory forms of lending? What if lands were restored to their original owners? If we really sought to reckon with the history of genocide and forced displacement enacted upon native peoples, the original occupants of every inch of this country, 
What if we understood that such conversations were not merely about our politics, but also about our faith, our deepest values, our relationship with God? What would it mean for the enslaved, victims of human trafficking and other forms of bondage, to go free? As people bold, audacious, and maybe foolish enough to seek to follow Jesus, what good news do we have for these neighbors of ours, for this world of ours? What is it precisely that God is calling us to do? And just importantly, who is God calling us to become? I've stuffed this sermon with questions so far. Good questions, maybe. Hard questions, too. Many of us did not grow up thinking that these questions belonged in conversations about the living of our faith, let alone that they were at the very heart of Christianity. The idea that being a Christian is principally a matter of one's personal piety would have been foreign to Jesus, as would any sense that following him simply involved being nice, kind, and wishing others well. More often than not, when God calls upon people to proclaim good news to the world, God also invites them to be that good news for the world. So let me ask one more question. This one from celebrated author and contemporary facilitator Priya Parker, which she uses to help organizations clarify who they are and what they are about. What is the biggest need in the world that you might have the passion and capacity to address? A few years ago, a friend and colleague of mine and his church began taking that question seriously. They looked around at their North Berkeley neighborhood, a wealthy and aging area, just at the edge of the UC campus, not at all far from several encampments filled with people struggling with addiction and homelessness. Reading the teachings of Jesus and sitting with many of the questions we've heard this morning, All Souls Episcopal Church began dreaming of using part of their property to provide much-needed affordable housing in their community, specifically serving low-income seniors and those with serious mental illness. The parish partnered with Satellite Affordable Housing Associates, who developed the project, and secured funding from the city, county, state, and banks to move forward with the $25 million initiative. As the plans began to come together, a group of neighbors organized to oppose a key zoning change that was necessary to make Jordan Court possible, which the parish only narrowly avoided. All Souls broke ground in September of 2020, and they will very soon welcome their first residents. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, he has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The passage we heard this morning together ends with Jesus declaring that those gathered in the synagogue, uh, to those gathered in the synagogue, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. It sounds stirring, almost triumphant, but the gospel itself goes on. Those gathered in the synagogue are not pleased with Jesus' teaching. They argue with him. They mock him. And when he presses his original point, they, and I quote, were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the cliff on which their town was built so that they might hurl him off the hill. That rage will catch up with Jesus in the end. The rage of those afraid of change, of justice, of mercy, of the reign of God's love. Following his call will cost Jesus everything, like it cost Archbishop Oscar Romero everything, and the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and countless other faithful throughout the ages. Perhaps that same anger and fear motivated those neighbors who stood against the zoning change in North Berkeley that will allow 34 lower-income seniors to finally have stable housing in their neighborhood. Following the way of Jesus means confronting the inertia of a world that seeks to deny good news to the most vulnerable, 
And that inevitably involves conflict and discomfort and tension and requires of us perseverance. We may not be called to change the geopolitical landscape, though some Christians surely are. But as people of faith, we are called to ask ourselves what God is inviting us to do and who God is inviting us to be in response to today's gospel. Christ Church has been good news to our neighbors before. We were good news to a local Japanese family when, in the 1940s, they were forced off their lands and into an internment camp, and our members helped to tend their property and return it to them years later. We were good news to our unsheltered neighbors when, for many years, we hosted the Alpha and Omega Shelter. We continue to be good news to those with insecure access to nutrition through our support of Community Services Agency and our monthly food drives, to the students and families of Intana School, to the isolated longing for connection, to those seeking meaning and beauty through our concerts and programs and worship. Still, I can't help but wonder what the biggest need today might be that we have the passion and capacity to address. I can't help but wonder what good news God is calling us to become next. Amen.
bless the women, the men, women, and children of every nation. Bless those who live where there is violence and poverty. Bless all ministers, ordained and lay. Let your grace flow through us as we reach out to others. For all who seek God, as did the Magi, guide us in your pathways. Give insight and sense of justice to the leaders in this and every land. May they have compassion on the most vulnerable among us. We are grateful for the gifts of water, grain, and fruit. Help us to be good stewards of the earth and its resources. Bless those who suffer in mind, body, or spirit. Guide us to the wellsprings of health and wholeness. We pray for the special joys and needs of our community. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, we pray for Hong Kong Shen Kung Lu Hui. In the diocesan cycle of prayer, Pray for St. Paul's Oakland, St. Paul's Burlingame, St. Paul's San Raphael, St. Paul's Walnut Creek, and St. Timothy's Danville. We pray in Thanksgiving for our parish school in Tana. We pray for those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, and those in any trouble. Gloria Wing, Jackie, Jean, Rick, Azure, Naya. Seraphine, Jen Berry, Dick Quinton, Tom Portsheimer, John, Ian, Lisa Kabulligan, Anna, Kristen, Dennis, Gail Morso, Carolyn, Gavin Cray, Frank Keister, Lizzie Hewitt, Derek, Jennifer, Warren Phillips, Lisa Rallano, Andreas, Curtis, Lisa, Linda Bell, Larry Van Nook, and the Reverend Vern Jones. We pray for the safety of health care providers everywhere, especially Kari Carla, Connie Heiston, and Alex Hawkins. We pray for all those affected by COVID-19 and all those struggling with anxiety, depression, and isolation. We pray for those who have entered eternal life and for those who mourn them especially Nancy Yee and Mary Cronin. We give thanks for answered prayers. I invite your own prayers of intercession and thanksgiving, either spoken aloud or in the silence of your heart. Thanks. Oh, listener to prayer. When the Magi journeyed for many days through the desert and the cold, you sent a star to guide them. Guide us, we pray, to sense your presence within us and all around. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us confess our sins that we may receive God's grace. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, forgive you all your sins through the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. I invite those here to stand as they're able. And get ready, folks on Zoom. We're about to unmute. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Peace of the Lord. Be with you, everyone. Peace, peace. Everyone. peace. peace. The Lord. Peace, everybody. Peace be with you.
Peace. Peace. Peace, Randy and Nancy. Peace, David. Peace, Peace to with, all of you. Peace to you with all, all of you. <laughs> there he is. Hi, David. <laughs> I'm RCM. Peace. Hi, David. Good Who's morning, up? everyone. <laughs> Peace be with you. I'll invite um, everyone on Zoom. You can re-meet yourself. If you're in the church, you can take a seat. It's wonderful to be all together today. A few announcements. Um, today at 11.45, we'll welcome Connie Young Yu for a special forum. Um, Connie is a local author and historian, uh, and she'll talk a bit about um, the history of Chinese immigration here in the Bay Area. Um, various stories from her own family's experience uh, and kind of the broader stories of um, this country and this particular place. Connie is really amazing. I've enjoyed getting to know her and hearing some of these stories um, as we've planned for the forum. So if you're able, I do encourage you to um, either stay or quickly go home and log on and join us um, on the computer. Either way is fine. We're going to, for those of you who are on Zoom, we're going to stay on this link. Um, so you'll be invited to visit for a little bit if you would like. Uh, but if you want to stay for the forum, you don't have to log off and log back on. Um, likewise, it will be offered in the church. So if you want to take a little break and then come back after the service at 1145, uh, we'll just have a few minutes in between. Next Saturday, the 29th, uh, we will celebrate the memorial for Chris Halverson. Um, the family has invited everyone in the parish, if you'd like to come, it will be both in person and online. All the information about that will be in our newsletter. Um, that's actually part of why we have a beautiful uh, water installation back up from Suki Bryan. So thank you so much to Suki and to Jim, who put this up yesterday. Um, Meg asked that we would uh, have kind of a water theme, and this is just such a gift to all of us. Um, we'll actually leave it up through Lent as well, so we'll get to enjoy it for the next several weeks. Uh, finally, next Sunday is our annual gathering. This is the one time in the year when everyone from the 8 o'clock and the 1015 service is invited to come together. We'll reflect on the year that has passed. We'll dream together about the year that is yet to come. Um, we'll approve the 2022 budget and um, celebrate the members of the vestry who are going off and elect new members uh, to the leadership of the parish. So it will be lovely. We're going to shorten the 1015 service so we can start right at 1130. And that will also be offered online and in person. So however you'd like to join, we hope you will. I think that is all. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
O God most mighty, O God most merciful, O God our rock and our salvation, hear us as we praise you. Call us, call us to your table, call us to your table, grant us your life. When the world was a formless void, you formed order and beauty. When Abraham and Sarah were barren, you sent them a child. When the Israelites were enslaved, you led them to freedom. Ruth faced starvation. David fought Goliath. And the psalmist cried out for healing. And full of compassion, you granted the people your life. You entered our sorrows and our joys in Jesus, our brother. He was born among the poor. He lived under oppression. He wept over the city. With infinite love, he granted the people your life. In the night in which he was betrayed for us, our Lord Jesus took bread. When he, and he gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering his death, we cry out, Amen. Amen. Celebrating his resurrection, we shout, Amen. Amen. Trusting his presence in every time and place, we plead, Amen. Amen. O God, you are breath. Send your spirit upon this meal. O God, you are bread. Feed us with yourself. O God, you are wine. Warm our hearts and make us one. O God, you are fire. Transform us with hope. O God, most majestic. O God, most motherly. O God, our strength and our song. You show us a vision of a tree of life with fruits for all and leaves that heal the nation. Grant us such life the life of the Father to the Son, the life of the Spirit of our risen Savior, life in you now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah! Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the peace. Alleluia. Gifts of God for the people of God. Holy food for holy people. This is God's table, and all are welcome.
body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. We'll now say the prayer for spiritual communion. Let us pray. In union with your faithful people, the altar of your church, where the Holy Eucharist is now being celebrated, we desire to offer to you praise and thanksgiving. We remember your death, Lord Christ. We proclaim your resurrection. We await your coming in glory. Since we cannot receive you today in the sacrament of your body and blood, we beseech you to come spiritually into our hearts. Cleanse and strengthen us with your grace, Lord Jesus. And let us never be separated from you. May we live in you and you in us in this life and the life to come. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and May God bless you with discomfort and easy, easy answers, half truths, and superficial relationships, so that you may learn to live deep within your heart. May God bless you with anger and injustice, oppression, and the exploitation of people, so that you may work for justice, freedom, reconciliation, and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer pain, rejection, disease, starvation, and war, so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and to turn their pain into joy. May God bless you with just enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in this world, so that you can indeed do what others claim cannot be done. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you this fine day and forevermore. Amen. Amen.
forth in the name of Christ. Alleluia. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Alleluia.